The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn in your copy of Holy Scripture or follow along on the screen in Isaiah chapter 9. We'll be reading verses 2 through 7 this morning. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 9, beginning there at verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, on the eve of your birth, as we gather around the words of Scripture, we pray we hear what you would have us to hear that we may be inspired to do what you call us to do, so that in this season and everyone hereafter, we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. In 1741, George Friedrich Handel composed his masterpiece, a work often heard this time of year and usually around Easter, his English oratorio, Messiah. Now the most recognizable movement of Handel's Messiah comes at the end of part two, scene seven, the 44th movement. It's the hallelujah chorus. You know how that goes, right? Like hallelujah. I'm not singing it, right? It's a piece of music that's been used in countless movies, television shows, advertisements, things like that. But second to the hallelujah chorus might be the 11th and 12th movements of part one, scene three. Movement 11 of this particular part of Handel's Messiah comes from the first verse of our text this morning. Uh, Handel used the English translation he had in his time, the King James Version of the text. And the soloist sings, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. He actually repeats that for about two minutes. And then right before he wraps up his little section, he kicks in, they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. The soloist sings this little re refrain for almost three minutes. But then, as it goes from movement 11 into movement 12, it's picked up by the full choir. And the text of verse 6 is sung. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And they say this over and over. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of music which Handel uses as an announcement of the Christ child's arrival, as an entry point in the nativity story of his Messiah just before the arrival and introduction of the shepherds in scene four. But these words from Isaiah 9 were given in a much different context. The prophet Isaiah is not proclaiming the future birth of a Messiah. Rather, the prophet is making the third proclamation involving the birth of a child as a sign that this present oppression, this present conflict and strife of the people of Judah is about to end. You see, the first prophet, the original prophet Isaiah, his ministry took place during really one of the most tenuous times in the history 
of Judah, the southern kingdom of the once united two kingdoms of Israel. The Assyrians were the superpower of the day. Their reach was tremendous. They ruled most of the known world. And the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes that had broken off, had decided that they were tired of it, and they aligned with a small nation of Aram. And together they sought for Judah to join their little coalition in this revolt against Assyria. But when the king of Judah, Ahaz, said, you know, God and his prophets have told me not to get involved with this, to remain neutral in the conflict, Israel and Aram said, that's fine, we'll attack you. And so they pointed their armies towards Jerusalem and Ahaz, threatening to attack if they didn't join in the revolt against Assyria. So the people of Judah were between a rock and a hard place, either remain neutral in an escalating conflict involving the very empire that controlled their existence and be attacked by an alliance including many of their kin or join this alliance and most certainly be wiped out. They didn't know what to do. So into this tension, into this difficulty, this is what the prophet Isaiah speaks of a child being born, not once, but three times. In Isaiah 7, the prophet says to King Ahaz, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And perhaps he looked around the court there, maybe he knew someone, but he said, Look, the young woman is with child, and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For the child, or before the child knows how to refuse evil and choose good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. In other words, this threat to Judah will be no more before a newborn child will be able to tell the difference between right and wrong. Then, in Isaiah 8, Isaiah talks of his own son when he says, I went to the prophetess, that's his, his wife, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, name him Maher Shalal Hashbaz. If you're looking for baby names, here's one. For before the child knows how to call my father or my mother, The wealth of Damascus, which is the capital of Aram, and the spoil of Samaria, the capital of Israel, will be carried away by the king of Assyria. Before Isaiah's own child can say, Mama, it's all going to be over. The conflict will be done. But it's not enough. So Isaiah has a third prophecy, the one we heard this morning. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually. There shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. That's not saying this child will do all this. This is to commemorate when God is going to bring this peace and justice. The birth of this child. The sun will signal the coming of peace, the reign of God, the establishment of justice and righteousness. So when did all that happen? When did all of this peace, justice, and righteousness happen? I mean, sure, uh, in the year 722, there about B.C., Assyria would just be done with Israel, wipe them off the face of the earth. The ten tribes have never come back together since. We'll just wipe them off. Aram, you, they, they were forgotten. But Assyria would continue to oppress Judah, and then the kingdom of Babylon would take over, followed by Persia, who would, would let the Israelites return to Jerusalem, but keep them on a short leash. Then there would be the Greeks who would persecute them heavily. Even one of the the Greek emperors would set up a a statue to himself in the most holy place, followed not too far by the Romans. There would be a glimmer of hope around the mid-2nd century B.C. when a man named Judas the Hammer, Judas Maccabeus, would show up and would run out the foreign government and establish the Hasmonean dynasty of Israel, but it would be crushed by the Romans in 63 B.C., and his emperor Pompey. All that is to say, for all of Isaiah's prophesying of peace, justice, and righteousness, for all of his pointing to the birth of a child as a sure sign of God's coming reign, it just never seemed to show up. The people were waiting 
always waiting, and it just never seemed to show up. In Isaiah's day, the people of Judah were terrified, unsure of the future. And what does the prophet do? He points to a baby. A baby. When the armies are threatening your borders, when allies are turning against you, when your future is uncertain and your very life hangs in the balance, the last thing you want somebody to do is say, here's a baby. You want to see footage of soldiers marching in step of tanks rolling out onto the battlefield, a sky filled with bombers, a leader pounding the podium, rallying the crowds to a cry for action. You don't want a baby. Babies can't do anything. Of course, the same was true when Mary first heard those words from Gabriel in the first chapter of Luke. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb, the angel tells her, and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus, which means the Lord saves. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, there will be no end. The people of Judea in Mary's time were under the oppression of the Roman Empire. All of this this anticipation was building. King Herod, not of the line of David, a puppet of Rome, was in charge. There was this growing sense of anticipation surrounding, when is God coming? When is God's reign coming? The prophets had talked about it for centuries. When is it coming? And then there was the recent uh, memory of Judas Maccabeus and all of these random little messiahs popping up all over the place in Judea. The people were waiting with bated breath for God's anointed one to arrive and finally, finally bring with him this longed-for peace, justice, and righteousness. They were scared, unsure of their future, always on the edge of their seats, hoping for deliverance. And then an angel comes, not to the top, to the pinnacle of Herod's gold-gilded temple, not, not to Rome, where at the seat of the emperor, Not to somebody with all the money and panache and flash of a billionaire. No, the angel comes to a nobody. A nobody in nowhere in some backwater town and tells her not your husband's going to raise up a good army. Not your brother is going to be picked by God. No, an angel shows up to this woman and says, surprise, you're going to have a baby. A baby. When the world is dark and there seems to be little hope left, the last thing you want is a baby. When there doesn't seem to be enough to go around and there's just too many mouths to feed, the last thing you want is a baby. When tomorrow is uncertain, when the news is filled with more chaos, confusion, and unrest, you don't want to be told that a baby is going to fix everything. Because what can a baby do? You want an aggressive piece of legislation, a powerful proclamation of determined might and strength, a sign that things will get better even if it takes extreme force and the sacrifice of others' lives. You don't want a baby. But that's what we've got, a baby. That's what we celebrate this season, a baby. That's who we'll celebrate tomorrow, a baby. Born in a barn to unwed parents, surrounded by poor field workers and their unwashed flocks. That's what we get, a baby. Not a conquering king, not a strongly worded piece of legislation, not a powerful alliance sure to secure victory, not an army of countless soldiers, not even an earth-shaking deity with blazing eyes and lightning bolt in hand. We get a baby, a baby. Fragile, helpless baby. Surely such a babe cannot stem the tide of war. Surely a baby can't bring peace and justice to a world twisted by greed and sin. Surely a baby can't bring righteousness, the righteousness of the kingdom of God. A God who made the universe and everything that 
ever was, is, or ever will be. Surely a baby can't save us, can it? Tomorrow morning, most of us will gather with family and friends around a tree in the living room, or maybe around a table in the dining room or the various chairs and couches spread throughout your house. And you'll open presents, you'll share stories, laugh and cry at memories of loved ones no longer with us. We'll eat good food, share in family traditions, maybe even take a nap or two or three. And most of us, most of us will have the luxury of forgetting about the troubles of the world, at least for a day. But what happens next? What happens after all the torn wrapping paper has been put in the trash can? What happens after all the leftovers are gone? What happens when your friends and family all pile into their cars and go back home? What happens when you start to take the decorations off the tree and the wreath off the door? Whatever darkness Christmas Day seemed to hold back will slowly start to seep its way back into our worlds. The weight of work will once again try to bend our backs the news of war and devastation will once again break our hearts. The stress of life and all that it entails may once again begin to shrink our sense of purpose, our sense of hope, peace, joy, and love. But even though the darkness may try to overtake us, a light still shines. Even though weight, the weight of this life's worry may try to bend us, there is one who still holds us up. Even though the evil, greed, selfishness, and sin of this world may try to shatter our hearts, there is one who loves, whose love holds us together and calls us to hold one another up. A baby. A baby born to live. To show the way of God's kingdom through selfless sacrifice. A baby born to teach us all the ways of God that they are not the ways of this world. A baby born to reveal to us that the very nature of God is not judgment, condemnation, or wrath, but love. A baby born to die so that the world may know that God has come to make a way where there once seemed to be no way. To cut through the darkness with the everlasting light of love. So whenever we think we need a soldier a conquering king, a divine warrior filled with power and might. Whenever we think we need that, God gives us a baby. Because darkness is not overcome by power. Sin is not overcome by strength. Selfishness and hate are not defeated by bombs or sheer force. No sin, self, hatred, and darkness can only be overcome by the power of love. Selfless love born of God. It's the kind of love which seeks nothing in return, nothing for itself. Love that seems to all others as weakness, as foolishness, as, as being taken advantage of, as loss, as powerlessness. It's the sort of love that pierces the darkness with its light because you can't snuff it out. It's that sort of love that says to those seeking a sign, looking everywhere, under every rock, and in every empty throne, that a child has been born for us, a son given to us. It's the sort of love that we celebrate this season, that sort of love we celebrate today, that sort of love whose birth we celebrate tomorrow, whose life, death, and resurrection calls us to let go of ourselves and take hold of that fragile, life-giving love so that we may be bringers of justice and righteousness, so that we may be the bearers of hope, peace, joy, and love, so that we may be a great light in this world's deepening darkness. When we want something powerful, when we want something that will crush our enemy, something that will lead us through 
We're not giving what we expect. God gives us a baby. May we celebrate that baby's life and the call that that child still gives to us today to pierce the darkness with the light of everlasting love. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, help us, God, to see in your birth not weakness, not frailty, not powerlessness, but God, help us to see in your birth that great eternal truth of your love. A love that seems to those who do not accept it as foolishness. To those of us, God, who, who cling to it. We know, Lord, it is strength and power beyond anything we can imagine. So, holy God, be with us this day as we do crown closer to the cradle. Help us to see in that box, God the frail, helpless child to see you in the sign of your love for us. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen.